So, here we go. I was born and raised amidst the flame and smoke of the great industrial Mon Valley, back when it was the epicenter in the production of one of our most important materials, steel. Used to make automobiles, bridges, skyscrapers, airplanes, can openers, and even the nails that hold your house together. There was a day you could leave from this mill site, or the one over on 2nd Avenue, travel up the Mon. You'd run into Homestead, Rankin, Braddock, Cl uh, Duquesne, Clareton, Denora, all the way up to Manessa. And you would never lose sight of a mill or an industry involved with the mills. Now, 15 years ago, Mr. Tim Cullen had a vision. And he took that vision and he dragged it on a long journey. <laughs> and along the way on that journey, he coaxed and cajoled individuals and, and organizations to help him in his endeavor. And what you see before you today is the culmination of that journey. I'm here and you are all here today to dedicate this sculpture not only to the workers and their families that made this region what it is today, but to everyone who helped make it possible. And even though it is a monument to our past, it is a monument to the present and to our future. Because within every fabric of this piece, there is, exists just as much sweat, blood, perseverance, and grit as anything our forefathers brought forth. Now I have a personal connection with this because I was a helper on a furnace. And I can tell you that the job that these workers did was heavy, dirty, hard, and dangerous as hell, especially before there was a union. Now I was part of, I was part of a wave of blue collar kids who got an opportunity to get a white collar education. And I can tell you the halls of academia were just as foreign and alien to me as a cast house floor would be to a young person today. So in the mid 70s, I wrote this piece called Steel Mill Scat, spoken word. Back in those days, there was no such thing as spoken word. It was just words. <laughs> so, um, what I did basically was take the jargon from the mill and use it to my advantage. But before we do this, I really want to give you a quick primer because I think there's a lot of people out there who have no idea what went on a blast furnace. And for any of you former steel workers out there, if I got my facts wrong, you can call, call me out on it later. I don't want to destroy my flow. <laughs> First of all, you got to think of a blast furnace as a giant mixer, a uh, blender, with the flames of hell at the base. And around the back is a railroad track that has bins below it. They deliver the coke, which is coal, that has been baked on the batteries for 16 hours. It's the worst job in the mill you could ever have. They have also had limestone and iron ore, and it went into the bins. Three or four stories below, you had the stock house. There was a Larry car with the Larryman driving it. In the middle of this track, there was a hole with a skip car. He would get a formula for how much of each material to put on for the cast. They would be shoved down into this skip car and taken to the top of the furnace. If you see a blast furnace, you always see that little sled ride up there. Now what was dangerous about this is materials would start to spill and somebody had to get in underneath the skip car. And it was very dangerous because if someone turned it on at the top or it broke, you'd be crushed. Now, the furnace. All around the furnace about eye height were blowpipes and tweers. Okay, the blowpipes were 300-pound torpedo-like tubes that had a little hole in it. And a, black, and a uh, foreman could look in there and tell if the cast was going well. Now, the tweer was a metal cork with pipes that supplied water to the, to the blowpipe to keep it from melting. But of course, they eventually melted. That's when they'd set a jag off like me up there to get it out. So you'd be up there with another person with a bent 
piece of rod and they expect you to catch this 300 pound piece while flames were shooting out in hot water. But that's another story. Now, the cast. You begin the cast by shooting the monkey, okay? Second helper go around the back that open it up so that the cinder, the impurities that float to the top due to the limestone, is skimmed off the top. So you can imagine it's a 94 degree day. You have your long underwear on, your blue jeans, your flame retardant pants, your t-shirt, your long underwear top, your long sleeve shirt, your flame retardant hat. You have your orange hard hat on, your goggles, your safety glasses, your shin pads, and you've got your 60 pound metatarsal shoes on. Then they put the 70 or 80 pound silver coat on you with a hood and say, hey, that stuff that's shooting out there, here's a 12 foot spoon. Catch some of it and put it in the ingot here so that later on they can take it to the lab and test it. So of course, comes the time for the cast. And you wonder, what's keeping all that molten material in that furnace? Play-Doh. Well, not literally, it was clay. They had a big Play-Doh machine that pumped the clay in, and when it came time to cast, the foreman would take the joysticks, drill up, and hope that he didn't hit a water pipe. Now, once that starts coming out, you have to remember, the cast house floor is slanted, and there's troughs in it. The troughs are made out of metal, so you have to line them with coke dust so the metal and the cinder does not stick. Then you have gates, so that once you fill one ladle up, you open up and go to the next one. Hopefully, except for number seven in Rankin, the second helper was always screwed because there was always cinder running down that track. The monkey just never did it. So, in conclusion, I think it's time to do the steel mill scat. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> this is only used for cinder. It was the, it was the uh, submarine ladles for the hot metal. And both this and the submarine ladle came across the hot metal bridge.